Hello friends, you're watching 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I'm Ryan Day and as always, it's a blessing to have each and every one of our family members and friends around the world joining us each and every week as we go through our Sabbath School quarterly together. And we're talking about mission and the title of this is God's Mission, My Mission. And God's mission should be our mission, right? And that's exactly what we're talking about this week mm -hmm. uh, as we continue through lesson two entitled God's Mission to Us, part two. And so I'm gonna introduce our panel members. I have. Pastor James Rafferty to my left. Always a blessing to Good have to be here, Ryan. Good to be here. I've got Monday's lesson, Making Disciples the Focus of Mission. Amen, amen. And then Miss Shelley Quinn. Mine is Tuesday, the eternal gospel, which is the message of the mission. Amen. And then Pastor John Lomacain. And mine is Wednesday, God's channel of mission. How is that mission accomplished in the earth? Amen, amen. And of course, Miss Jill Morricone. Thank you, Ryan. I have Thursday, the world, the arena of mission. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I'm sure from last week, our first lesson, you uh, were tremendously blessed. I know I, I was as an evangelist. This is close to my heart. I love this message because uh, this quarter we're going to be focusing obviously not on a single book, but we're looking at the topic of mission, mm -hmm. evangelism. What's the motivation behind it? And what is our mission? What is our goal as followers of Christ? And uh, we're going to learn what that is throughout this quarter together. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the uh, memory text for this week, and then we're going to have a prayer and launch right into our study. So our memory text is found from that famous verse in Matthew chapter 28, mm -hmm. verse 19. What does it say? It says, go therefore mm -hmm. and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so if you would, Jill, would you have a prayer for us? Holy Father, we're grateful that you are the God of mission and that you call us and give us opportunity to engage in that mission. And we just ask right now for the infilling of your Holy Spirit, you would open up our minds and hearts to receive what you have for us in your word. And we ask this in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I always like to uh, read Sabbath afternoons uh, section just because it provides a really nice foundation as we're starting to launch into this particular topic. Uh, but it says here, it says the theme that God as a God of mission runs throughout scripture. It, or it says it is the connecting thread of human history and it demonstrates God's purpose for his creation. Furthermore, it consolidates divine revelation with a main focus the restoration of God's image in the fallen children. And of course that comes from Colossians chapter three, verses nine and 10, and also 1 John chapter three and verse two. It says the mission of God also functions as the background through which we should see and understand God's word to us. When we read the Bible, we can identify a God who is intentionally reaching out to us. In spite of the separation caused by sin, through his mission, God continues to restore the broken relationship with humanity until the glorious moment when he will make all things new. Mm -hmm. In the meanwhile, God has chosen to manifest himself to us in such a way that we can understand his nature and purpose. And above all, we can have a real and lasting relationship with him. Mm -hmm. In other words, we do not only come to know him, but also share with others our experience with him and his saving love. Of course, in the scriptures then, God gives us the basic elements of what his mission is all about. I love that. It's all about him. It's all about his love. And as we progress through this, we're going to see this theme come back up over and over again, that the motivating factor, of course, is always sharing him. But in sharing God, we're sharing the love of God. Mm -hmm. It's always God's love towards us. And again, if we learn that we have love towards God, if we are to love God, we are to also love others because he loves us. And we're going to see that come up all through the lesson. Now, Sunday's lesson uh, brings highlight to the triune God, the origin of mission and how the whole Godhead is involved in this mission. It's not just about Jesus. Of course, we know that's all about him in terms of salvation, our creator, of course, our, our loving uh, salvation in him that we find. But at the end of the day, we cannot leave out the fact that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all involved in this mission together. And so actually uh, the lesson brings out that the mission of God in Scripture 
scripture has Jesus at the front and center of the only way to salvation. And we know that because Jesus makes it clear that he is the way, the truth, and the life there in John chapter 14 and verse 6. And he makes it clear that no one comes to the Father except through him. But also Jesus helps us uh, to know that the Father, uh, that, that nothing comes except from him, but obviously the connection is also to the Father. It says it also helps us to understand the certainty of the triune God to his mission. Everything Christ did was either for or from the heavenly father. And we see this in John chapter four and verse 34, where Jesus says, my food, my meat, my meal, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So Jesus came, was robed in flesh, came as the son of God, but everything that he done was not in of himself, but only from what the father had given him. We see this also in John chapter five and verse 30, which says, I can of myself, Jesus speaking. He says, I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own, but the will of the father who sent me. Jesus was always pointing us back to his father because of course, that's what salvation is all about, right? At the end of the day, it's us recognizing that it's not about us. It's all about him. We must decrease. He must increase. And Christ displayed that in his daily words and his daily actions and in his life and character. John chapter 12, verse 44 and 45 also nails this down as well. It says, then Jesus cried out and said, he who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I love that. So Jesus bringing glory to his father, the one who sent him for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I love that. Uh, however, we must also remember that Jesus' mission did not begin when he came into the world. But of course, uh, him and the father shared in that mission long before Christ came and of course was robed in flesh. Ephesians chapter one, verse three and four brings this out, which says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And verse four says, just as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Also, first Peter chapter one and verse 19 and 20 again brings this out very clear that even before Christ came as the son of God, robed in flesh, becoming among us and one of us, he shared in the mission with the father and the spirit long before. It goes to say in first Peter chapter one, verse 19 and 20, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, right. but was manifested in these last times for you. So therefore God planned his outreach to humanity even before he laid the foundations for us. But we also cannot leave out the aspect of the Holy Spirit, which there seems to be some, um, I mean, let's just be honest, in the, in the days that we're living in, there is a, a war against the person of the Holy Spirit. There is a movement, a work that tries to discredit or tries to make it less personal, that it's some type of power force, that it's just the Father and the Son, but yet we see this triunity in God at work all the way through Scripture. There is some strongly suggestive text that clearly pro uh, projects to us and communicates to us that uh, the Godhead, the fullness of the Godhead, Father, Son, and even Holy Spirit is involved in this work. The Son created the world. We see that in John chapter 1, verse 3. And the it says, in the fullness of time, God demonstrates His love by sending the Son here. Then notice those, notice this, it says the son came, died on the cross and conquered death. The lesson brings out then sent from the father, the spirit came here. I love this, convicts the world and today continues the mission of the father and the son by empowering and by sending God's people out for mission. So what does Jesus say in John chapter 14 and verse 26? He reminds us another helper will come, the parakletos, as we see there in the Greek, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance the, all things that I have said to you. And then you jump over to John chapter 16. We see again, the Holy Spirit come back into view here in the aftermath of Christ's ascension into heaven. It says, Jesus says in John chapter 16 and verse seven and eight, he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage mm -hmm. that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, that is the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And verse eight, and he, will, he has come, uh, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness 
righteousness and of judgment. And then, of course, you can't leave out the purpose of the Holy Spirit as Christ, uh, when he was here, always was pointing back to the Father and giving glory to the Father. We also see that the mission of the Holy Spirit is not just to come and manifest in and of himself to, to, to bring attention to himself, but actually to point us back to the Son, that is Jesus Christ and his teachings and his right. word and his character. We see this in John 16, verses 13 through 15. Notice what it says here. Jesus speaking again says, However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. And notice, he will not speak on his own authority. Did Jesus come and speak on his authority? No, uh, he spoke with the authority of the father. But he goes on to say, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Verse 14, he will glorify me, Jesus right. says, for he will take of what is mine mm -hmm. and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I say that he will take of mine and declare it to you. There's the Godhead right there in that picture. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all in one united mm -hmm. mission. Mm -hmm. And so we also see this, this triunity of God declared there in John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22. And, the, and actually the, the, the lesson brings out the question is how should the, how should the understanding that mission finds its origin in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit shape our mission. Notice John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22. It says, so Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. That's and right. when, he has said, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so we see here that even the, while the word Trinity, and we often hear that. I, I try not to use that word, not necessarily because I'm ashamed of that word, but because it's so misunderstood and it kind of has a, a negative connotation. I like to use the word Godhead because it still is encompassing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But while the word Trinity is not necessarily found in the Bible, we do see, as we have brought out, that there is a mission-focused Trinitarian evidences or triune evidences uh, that are numerous throughout the Scripture. And the lesson brings out and says that here we find the reality of the Godhead's mission in one sentence. And this is of course found in, uh, in, in what we had just read, but it also is found in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, which says, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you come, uh, until you have been clothed with power from on high. So notice there again is another emphasis that God, the father, the son and the Holy Spirit are in unity. They are one in purpose and goal and agenda and in mission as we are seeing. And that's important that we highlight that. That's important that we bring that out, I think, because Sunday's lesson is highlighting that and emphasizing that because if God is together and in one accord, if the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all mission-minded and they're all in one accord, what does that say about the church? Should the church also, should God's followers also be sharing in that same uh, oneness of mind or that same unity in mind and in focus and in mission? We learn from this that the mission is not ours, as we said. Uh, it belongs to the triune God and such. It will Will not fail. I love that. That's what the, the lesson this week ended on. It's God's mission. It should be our mission as well. And we should never forget that this mission will not fail. So why not be on the winning side, right? Mm -hmm. I want to be on the winning side. If, Lord, if this is what's important to you, then it's important to me. If being mission minded and missionary minded is what it is that you will call me to do, then I will gladly lay my life down as you have laid yours down for me. I will lay it down for you and I will give my life to you in mission and in goal and in purpose for the kingdom of God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. The quarterly has me picking up right where you left off actually right. there. And the idea is that we are to focus on mission. My name is James Rafferty and I'm picking up on Monday's lesson, Making Disciples the Focus of Mission. And so Ryan was talking about how Christ had said, you know, wait here until you receive the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And here in Monday's lesson, we pick up in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. And the focus of the mission here in these verses. So let's just read the verses, Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. It begins here by saying, Then the eleven disciples went away unto Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Hmm which really blows me away. When I read that, I thought, well, really? Some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach, the King James says, marginal reference, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Now the lesson quarterly brings out here that there are 
four basic components of the Matthew 28, 16 through 20 commission. And they can be seen in these four simple aspects. Number one, Jesus commands his disciples to go to Galilee to be with him. God is calling us to be with him. First and foremost, if we're going to make disciples, right? Amen. God is calling us to connect with him. We can't make disciples ourselves. We have to connect with God and God then works through us to make these disciples. We connect with him. Number two, Cordley brings out, Jesus comes to them declaring his authority and sovereignty. So right. we have this call to be with Christ, which by the way, the Sabbath reminds us of that call. Every week we're called to connect with Christ. And then of course, Jesus comes to be with us and he declares his authority and his sovereignty. You know, we receive authority for baptism and for the commission from Jesus Christ. That's where the authority comes from. Number three, Jesus then commissions his disciples to a specific task, namely making disciples. Mm. Now, what does it mean to make disciples? And then number four, Jesus promises to be with his disciples until the end. Discipleship making is the primary focus of the Great Commission, the quarterly goes on to say on Monday's lesson. And the main task of mission, literally in the original Greek language, the beginning of Matthew 28, 19 says, having gone therefore, make disciples. The therefore gives to the commission its foundation on what has just been presented, Jesus' power, Jesus' authority, His sovereignty. All these things come from the victory that has mm -hmm. been attained in His resurrection. Mm -hmm. We make disciples because of what Jesus has accomplished. We make disciples because of His victory and His resurrection. But what does it mean to make disciples? I like what Alejandro Bullion says in his book on making disciples, which is entitled, Sharing Jesus is Everything. Here's what he says. What you need to do is simply be yourself in the transformed life Jesus clothes you with. Mm -hmm. Carry on with all your daily activities, but with the enriched purpose of sharing the same good news with others that brought peace to your own heart. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, to, to separate blocks of additional time from your already booked agenda in order to do missionary work. Essentially, you simply shine with the light of Jesus while interacting with your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, mm -hmm. your colleagues. You are simply being yourself. That's all. Unquote. I love that. It's Being good. yourself in the transformed life that God has given you. Mm -hmm. In other words, God converts us and that uniqueness that we have now in Christ, renewed in Christ, forgiven in Christ, accepted in Christ, reconciled in Christ, that uniqueness that we have now goes out to those that we engage with, to our relatives, to our colleagues, to our neighbors, to friends, to people we interact with, and they see Jesus in us. Sometimes they see Jesus in us when we don't even see Jesus in us <laughs> because Jesus shines through us in spirit spite of ourselves right. many times. We are being what God has called us to be, the unique people that we are. In other words, we don't have to try to be like somebody else. We don't have to look at some successful evangelist or Bible worker or pastor or teacher and say, oh, if I mimic them, if I act like them, if I'm more like they are, maybe yeah. then I can have this kind of success they have. No, no, no. You, God has called you to a unique purpose. You right. are unique in His standing That's before right. His eyes and you have a unique mission that God wants you to accomplish. Be yourself. Be who you are, who you are in Jesus Christ. It's important to highlight the only action verb the quarterly goes on to say with the imperative force in the Great Commission. It is discipleship making. Mm. Teaching everyone, baptizing them, sharing Jesus' teachings to the world are the characteristics of the discipleship process. Discipleship making is what God is calling us to. And again, that means being yourself in the renewed power of Jesus Christ with your neighbors, your relatives, your friends, your colleagues, being who God made you to be in truth and in reality, revealing His image to the world. It is indeed one of the greatest mission passages in all of Scripture. The quarterly goes on to say it ends with Jesus' promise of continuous presence with His followers. So furthermore, the message to be conveyed, the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ, is intended for the entire world with no geographical, social, or ethnic limitations. God is seeking to reach every single person. And that's why all of us are important because all of us are unique. All of us have a unique contribution to make to this mission of Jesus Christ. The mission is to make disciples. How is this mandate of the Master affecting how you live and minister to others? The quarterly goes on to ask, what can you do to be more involved in what you've been called to do? There's a quotation that we like to refer to often 
in the writings of Ellen White. It's in Ministry of Healing, page 143. And here's what it says. Christ's method alone will mm. give true success in reaching people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. Mm -hmm. He showed sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs. Yeah. He won their confidence. And then he bade them follow me. Mm -hmm. So you can see why this is such an important statement because it lays a beautiful foundation for how any one of us can do discipleship work. In other words, God isn't calling us to necessarily go to seminary or to get a degree or even go to a training school, though we do have one starting soon. I don't know if I want to do a throw off on that, but anyway, we first and foremost become new creatures in Jesus Christ. And as we become new creatures in Jesus Christ, each one of us is a vessel that God will use to reach somebody else. First and foremost, we give our hearts to Jesus and then he uses us to witness to those who are around us. Here's some do's and don'ts, uh, a little list of do's and don'ts just to close this out. And most of this comes from the book of Daniel. So do, when you do discipleship work, do hold your personal convictions regarding eating, drinking, entertainment without moral compromise. In other words, to be a disciple, you want to have moral conviction and you want to hold to those moral convictions because when people see you in your new experience with Jesus Christ, like my friends saw, saw me, my roommates that I used to party with saw me, no longer partying with them, no longer partaking of drugs and alcohol, it struck a conviction in their hearts and they started asking me questions about what happened to me and how I had changed. Be true to your convictions. Daniel was in Daniel 1 verse 8. Number two, Take an interest in the secular affairs of others and pray for them. Daniel found himself in a situation where his life was at, at stake. He was actually supposed to die with the rest of the wise men of Babylon, Daniel chapter 2. But instead of trying to defend himself or justify himself, he actually reached out of himself to find out what was troubling the king. What's wrong with the king? Maybe I can help. And then he went in before the king and he said, tell me what's troubling you. And after that, he went into a prayer session with his friends. He said, you know what? We need to pray for the king. He's had this dream. It's troubling him. We need to pray for him. Get outside of your own cares, mm -hmm. your own concerns, yeah, and take an interest in others. That's what we read in Ministry of Healing 143. Then, do see if there's anything you can do while there is time to serve based on your God-given abilities and talents. In other words, do service for others. Try, if you can, to do something within your sphere of influence. Every single one of us can pray. Every single one of us can share Bible verses with people or pray for people or claim promises for people. None of us need any kind of special degree in order to do that and be disciples in that sense. And then seek to be filled with the Spirit of God. Daniel, we're told in Daniel 3.25, Daniel 4.8, Daniel 5, 11 through 14, Daniel 6.3, he was known. He was known by the, the leaders in Babylon. He was known by the people of Medo-Persia. He was known by everyone. Uh, an incredible spirit is in him. The spirit of the gods is in him, they used to say. Mm -hmm. He has an amazing spirit. Let the spirit of God work through you. Let your heart be filled with the spirit of God. So again, we want to be firm in our convictions as, as we seek to make disciples. We want to have an interest in the concerns of others. We want to get outside of ourselves and then we want to pray for others and do what we can do, claim promises for them. And then finally, we want to be filled with the Spirit of God. We want the Spirit of God to pour out of us toward others so that they can be attracted to heaven mm -hmm. and the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much, friends. We're going to take the short break. Don't go anywhere. We will be back in just a moment. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to pass it on to Michelle Quinn for Tuesday's lesson. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you, James, both for your lessons. I'm Shelley Quinn. Tuesday's lesson is the everlasting gospel. This is the message of the mission. 
In Revelation chapter 14, there are six verses that tell of three angels' messages to the world. It's an end time message. Let me read just verses 6 and 7, Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come, mm -hmm. and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. From our study guide, this is a quote. It says, this is the only place in Scripture where the words everlasting and gospel are connected. The gospel is the good news of grace offered to all through Jesus Christ. He came into our world to show us grace and truth. He lived a sinless life and died on the cross as a substitutionary sacrifice to bear the penalty of our sins. He rose to life, resurrected and returned to heaven, was exalted by the Father, and today intercedes for us in the heavenly sanctuary. He will soon fulfill his great promise to return in majesty and glory and ultimately after the millennium to establish God's kingdom on earth. These are the essential realities of the eternal gospel. Now, let me read to you something that Paul wrote to Timothy during his just this is close to Paul's death. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, Paul says to Timothy, Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, a calling that results in both imputed righteousness for justification by faith and infused righteousness for sanctification by faith. But he says, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose mm -hmm. and grace, which was given to us when it was given to us in Christ Jesus, Paul says, before time began, mm -hmm. before time began, the Godhead, and that would be God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Mm -hmm. It isn't one plus one plus one. It's not God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It is God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. One times one times one equals one. And so they purposed to offer humanity salvation by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, for by grace you have been saved. Yeah. And that is through faith, not of works that any, it's, he says it is the gift of God. It is not of works that we can boast of anything. When Jesus died on the cross, he offered justification to the entire world, but you have to receive that gift. In 2 Timothy 1.10, Paul says, it has now been revealed by the appearing of, of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Grace given to us before time began. God's everlasting covenant of grace can be summarized in these three scriptures. And you know, they're my favorite. Revelation 13, 8 talks about Jesus Christ being the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world, before our world ever existed, before we were created, God had a plan 
to rescue humanity in, if they sinned. Hebrews 13, 20 says that Christ's blood is the blood of the everlasting gospel. That's and right. what is the purpose of the gospel? 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Jill, that he, God the Father, made him the person of Jesus Christ, him who knew no sin, mm -hmm. to be sin for us that for this purpose, we might become the righteousness of God in him. So before the world was created, before humanity was created, God made, the God had made this covenant among themselves to restore righteousness in humanity through faith in the Messiah Christ. And I want to tell you something, God has only had ever one plan of salvation. The Old Testament, the patriarchs, the saints were saved looking forward to the coming Messiah. They were saved by righteousness, by faith. And we are saved looking back mm -hmm. to his ministry on the cross and also to his ministry as our high priest. He became our substitute. Just, you were talking about this earlier. The word Trinity may not be in the Bible, Neither is the word incarnation, but both are very descriptive. So to think that our creator God came down, humbled himself in, in humiliation. He took on our flesh and became like us in every way that he might die for our sins. And listen to this, Isaiah 42 verses six and seven. This is one of the servant songs. This is the Lord, the father of the Godhead speaking to the Messiah Christ. And he says, I, the Lord have called you the Messiah in righteousness. I will hold your hand. I will keep you and I will give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring prisoners out from prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. He says the same thing in Isaiah 49, 8. I will give you as a covenant. The That's person right. of Jesus Christ is the everlasting covenant. Amen. And the good news is that the everlasting covenant is unchanging. God is, says, I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And James 1, 17 says that there is no variation or shadow if turning in him. God is consistent. And so we know that he, made this everlasting covenant. He, by the way, God makes all the covenant promises. Mm -hmm. God keeps all of the covenant promises. This is not a contract. What happens is God looks down and he says, John Lomaking, I have invited you to enter into covenant with me. And when John Loma King raises his hand and says, I receive you, Jesus Christ, as my Savior and as my Lord, you enter into covenant with God. And you know what God expects of his covenant children? He expects loyalty. Mm -hmm. He expects obedience and he empowers us to obey. It is motivated by love. So very quickly, because I'm running out of town, the three angels' messages are based on this foundation of the everlasting gospel. If people don't understand the everlasting gospel, they're not going to understand the warnings of the three angels' message. So we need to be preaching righteousness by faith, the everlasting gospel. Then we bring the warning to the people. The three angels' messages are to not only gain attention of those in other, when, when God says in Revelation 18, come out of her, my people. It's not just other denominations. It is to wake us up mm -hmm. to have a, an intimate relationship with the Lord. And my time is gone, but that is the everlasting gospel. 
And it is the message of our mission. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, James. Thank you, Ryan. And mine is God's channel of mission. How is this mission accomplished on earth? You know, when you pray the prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The mission of God is being carried out in heaven, but how is it being carried out on earth? Uh, the lesson brings out this very important point. I'd like to begin with the statement. Throughout history, God has always had those who, one, faithfully, faithfully represent his character and in obedience follow his purposes. God's people are those who have been called and who have accepted the invitation. Amen. Thank you for that segue. To be partakers of his grace. All of them have been and continue to be God's instruments for the fulfillment of his mission. When you think about the mission that God has, and as you're watching the program, we've been talking about a lot of things that are basically theological, but I want to just challenge you first. God has a mission for your life. Mm -hmm. Amen. Every one of us is called, yes. but the mission, can only be ex uh, the mission can only be experienced in a blessing mm -hmm. when you enter into that covenant relationship. Uh, I want to just say this, Shelley, you know, we've been hearing this word covenant quite a bit, and you've written a book about the covenants, which is a wonderful uh, work that you've done. But consider this for a moment. If you're not in covenant relationship with God, I just want you to grab this. Are you just having an affair with God? Mm. Now, listen to that. This is a powerful That's statement. Good. That's good. Because when you're not in a covenant relationship, you're just hanging around for what you can receive. Mm -hmm. And all the conditions are based on your liking That's or your good. disliking. So many people are hanging around God because of what he gives. He gives rain to the just and the unjust. He blesses all of us abundantly. We have our needs being supplied. Everything about God, he is a covenant keeping God. He makes a promise to supply all of our need. And believe me, he does it faithfully, never backs down on it. But, but many people are in a conditional, non-covenant relationship with God. And, and we were talking about this and my wife having been married 40 years. We said, wow, what a sermon, having an affair with God. Mm. And that is not a derogatory terminology. That means you're just not in covenant with him. That's why you can walk away when things don't go your way or you could leave when you don't like what's happening and you can say, I'm no longer following the Lord. And I believe that those disciples that walked away from him, yeah. they were not in a covenant relationship. It's obvious. So being in a covenant, and this is my segue, a covenant relationship is not the same as employment. Mm -hmm. That's right. People work for God. Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23, they were working, casting out demons, doing many wonderful works, prophesying in his name but because they were not in a covenant relationship. Now look at the next part of the covenant. He said, I never knew you. I never knew you. My wife and I know each other. Why? We're in a covenant relationship. If you're not in a covenant relationship, you may do the things that may appear to be connected with the relationship, but there's no covenant. So it's on a conditional basis. God does not call his people into an employment. He calls his people into a covenant. Yeah. Ephesians 2.10 is deeper than just, hey, I got this work that I want you to do. And a lot of people join the church and want to get to work right away without understanding this covenant relationship. Mm -hmm. Because if the covenant does, if the work doesn't, if they don't like the work, that's why as a pastor, it always bothers me when people say, you know, we put the offices together, we want to select people to work. They say, well, I'm going to just sit it out this year because I've been in, in that position for two years. <laughs> Who sits it out in a covenant relationship? Who sits it out? When you're in a relationship with God, you don't sit it out. There's no rest on this side of the cross. <laughs> There's going to be a day when well done, thou good and faithful servant. Right now, servants are in covenant relationships, not in employment. Well, I don't want to be a deacon this year. Well, I don't want to be that this year. I say, what if I told you I don't want to be your pastor this year? <laughs> you know, they'd have a hard time with that. So we are in a relationship that's not based on our conditions, but based on the God that is the same. Come on. Yesterday. Yesterday. Today. today and forever. So God calls us for a preordained work that is based on the covenant. So Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And I want to add this for covenant works, mm -hmm. which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When it's on covenant, you don't say, I quit. Mm -hmm. You don't say, I'm tired. Mm -hmm. Now we may get exhausted, but then again, who hasn't been? So we are chosen and the lesson brings us out that we were chosen within a covenant relationship with God based on an implied conditionality, meaning 
being faithful and being obedient. Amen. Mm -hmm. So that's what a covenant requires, faithfulness and obedience. Mm -hmm. It's not the same as employment. So I brought out, Jill, seven things that I think are a part of the covenant <laughs> relationship and they're all a part of the mission. I know you have a list also, so I'm kind of getting, getting you ready for Jill. Mine's small today. You have small today? <laughs> mission did not originate with the church, but the reason why the lesson is called God's channel of mission, the church is the channel of mission to the world, mm -hmm. not just a place of great activity. First of all, let's talk about the mission. And these are my definitions, so it may differ from yours. Mission, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Mm -hmm. Luke 19, 10. The mission of Jesus, he came to seek and to save those who are lost. Anybody in a lost condition is in God's manifest. Go find them for me. The launching of the mission, we talked about that. Matt, uh, I think that Ryan mentioned that. Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, which is go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the, and then teaching them to observe all things I've commanded them. And though I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's the launching of the mission. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the mission is launched, you have to be equipped for the mission. Now, this is important. The equipment of the mission is deeper than just understanding the 28 fundamentals. You could have a lot of great, um, what, what I call, um, not amenities, uh, great, uh, when a car has a lot of different, great options in your car. Accessories. Great, uh, accessories, thank you. A lot of accessories, but if you have no gas in the car, it's great. You're not going anywhere. The church has a lot of accessories. I'm using that term loosely. Mm -hmm. But without being equipped, your mission will not succeed. Yeah. Acts 1 verse 8, but you shall receive power yes. when the Holy Spirit has yes. come upon you. Then you shall be witnesses mm. to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You've got to be empowered. Mm. This is why daily praying for the infilling of the Spirit is more than just studying your Sabbath school lesson. That's right, man. More than just familiarizing yourself with how to do evangelism or how to prepare a sermon. You've got to be powered on a day-by-day -day basis. Without that, you're trying to accomplish in human effort mm -hmm. what can only be accomplished by divine empowerment. Mm -hmm. So the focus of the mission, and to me, this is the focus that I've gotten, John 12, 32, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Why do I call that the focus? Because I don't believe that people should be converted to doctrine. I believe people should be converted to Jesus Christ first. That's right. Then the doctrine makes sense because you have the covenant relationship. Amen. Who wants you to keep the Sabbath? If you don't know who it is, then it's just a day for you. But if you know who it is, hey, it's more than a day. That's right. Who wants you to remember to get ready for a soon return? If you're getting ready for the second coming of somebody you don't know, then you're just getting ready for an event. I'm looking forward to meeting someone mm -hmm. that I've spent day by day with. What's the end game of the mission? Matthew 24, 14. Thank you, Shelley, talking about the three angels' messages. But what's the end game of the mission? Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached Preach in? All the world. All the world. All the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end will come. You've got to participate in this covenant relationship, not losing the end game like a runner who says, I see the finish line. When, you, when you're in a race, remember, it's not given to the swift. We, have to, we don't have to run but those who endure to the end. So don't be discouraged. Be not weary in doing well. In due time, you will reap if you do not faint. Don't forget that Galatians 6, 7. So remember that. Don't faint. There's an end game here. You've got to proclaim that gospel until Jesus comes. Then there is, I call the imperative of the mission. Now, these are mine. Mm -hmm. The imperative of the mission. What is the imperative? And this is so relevant to today where the church is distracted by all kinds of side issues, political Thank the Lord we made it through the COVID issues. Hallelujah to that. But still, there are a lot of distracting issues. Mm -hmm. What did Paul consider the imperative of his mission? Here it is, 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, for I determined not to know mm -hmm. anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It is important to rightly understand the teachings of the church and the biblical teachings, but don't put that before knowing Christ. If you know Christ first, everything falls in place. And this is what the Apostle Paul meant. I want to know him first. Mm -hmm. When I know him, then my mission is clear. Mm -hmm. I have a focus. I have a purpose. I know exactly for whom I'm working and who I'm, glorif who I'm glorifying. And then I know you're going to deal with this in detail, but the field of the mission. Mm -hmm. That's what you're going to be covering in detail. 
The field of the mission is Revelation 14, 6. Shelley alluded to that, which is, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. 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 To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. That's the field of the mission. And this statement is so significant in the book Testimonies for the Church, volume 3, page 381. The mission of the church, the mission of the church of Christ is to save perishing sinners. Mm. It is to make known the love of God to men and to win them to Christ by the efficacy of that love. And I think Ryan was alluding to that. Mm -hmm. If we don't love God, we can't communicate that love. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to be God's channel of mission? Learn to love Christ first. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much, Pastor John. Well put together. Praise I love God. that. Shelley, Pastor James, Ryan, I loved what each one of you had to share. God's mission to us, part two. I'm Jill Morricone and I have Thursday's lesson, The World, Arena of Mission. Now, I really like words. I don't know why I've liked words, I think my whole life. I like the crafting of words. I like the sound of words. I like the delivery of words. I love when people speak, I outline in my mind. It's just, it's fascinating to me. Um, one of my majors in college was actually English. And when you study English, you learn they have what they call the five W's in any kind of investigative writing and research. This is used to gather information about a story or a subject. You know what the five W's are? Who, what, where, when, why. And then they always add how, which isn't a W at all, but it's just the extra one after that. So in my mind, if I were to separate out our lesson into who, what, where, when, why, how, the who, who's involved in the mission? Ryan covered that. Mm -hmm. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Pastor John covered that too, the church, God's people, those in covenant relationship are involved in sharing the mission. What is the mission? Shelley covered that well, the everlasting gospel. Pastor John also referenced the mission is Jesus, John chapter 12. When does the mission take place? From the beginning of time. When sin entered this world, we see uh, stories from the Old Testament and the New Testament that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit have been involved in bringing us back into right relationship with the Father. Mm -hmm. How is the mission spread? Pastor James covered that. It spread by making disciples. Where is the mission? That's the focus of my, life, mm -hmm. my day. Where is the mission to take place? And why does the mission take place? Now, my lesson didn't cover why, but I'm going to touch on that just briefly. So we're going to look at Acts 1-8. We're going to unpack mm -hmm. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 for my lesson. And Pastor John already read it, but we're going to read it again. Acts 1, verse 8. We're looking at where is the gospel to be shared? And then we have three points for where the gospel is to be shared. And as we look at that, we're going to then unpack why. Underneath each one of those points, why do we share the gospel? Where is it to be shared? Acts 1, 8. But you shall receive power. This is dunamis, miraculous power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Pastor John already talked about the importance of the infilling of the Holy Spirit for you and I to be involved in mission. You shall be witnesses to me. The word witness is martus. Witness means someone who has seen or heard or knows by any other means. You know, if you're called as a witness on a stand, what do you share? You share something that you heard. You share something that you saw. So in this case, we are to be witnesses. You could literally say we're eye and ear witnesses of the gospel. Eye and ear witnesses of Jesus and what he has done in our lives. But where is it to be shared? You're to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Where is the gospel to be shared? Number one, to those we know. Mm. That's right. Those in our own neighborhood or family. We can only share what we have experienced. The sharing of the gospel is so much more effective if you actually know Jesus. If you've met Jesus for yourself. I've shared this before, but the reason I made the decision to accept Jesus is because of my mom. Mm -hmm. 
the influence and the example of my mom. When she met Jesus, I was 13 years old and her life changed in such a drastic way, I decided there's something to Christianity mm -hmm. and I want to experience it. I want to see it for myself. She was a witness to me mm -hmm. of the gospel lived out in our home. Why do we share with those we know? We're to share to those we know in Jerusalem, in our own neighborhood. I think sometimes people won't listen to a sermon. Mm. They won't listen or read. They won't listen to someone on TV. They won't read a book, but they will listen to people they know. They will listen to people that they love and that they trust. There are some people in your life that only you have the opportunity to witness to because you're close to them. It could be a family member. It could be a coworker. It could be a neighbor, somebody that you know the Lord has put in your life for a purpose for you to be able to witness to them. I think the most effective witness is a transformed life. And you can really see that with people that you know. The transformed life is most visible in the home, um, maybe in the workplace with people you work with on a daily basis. So where else are we to witness? First would be witnesses, Acts 1-8 in Jerusalem. And what's the next passage? It says in Judea and Samaria. Now traditionally, or well, at least I always thought traditionally, we always said first we witness at home. Then we witness to the broader community. Then we witness to the world. But if you think about the Samaritans, mm -hmm. did the Jews really like the Samaritans? Mm -hmm. They didn't. So what Jesus is telling them is you are to witness, this is Jill's interpretation, to those you are prejudiced against. That's right. The gospel is to go to those people we don't naturally like, those people we don't naturally want to talk to, those people we'd rather avoid. It's easy to witness in Jerusalem. Well, sometimes it's easy to witness at home and sometimes it's not. But it's especially hard to witness to those people we naturally hate. I think the gospel, the witness of the gospel is particularly effective when it's cross-cultural. The gospel breaks down race and creed and class and nationality and culture. Galatians 3, 27 to 29, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Why are we supposed to share the gospel to those people that we don't naturally like or those people that we're prejudiced against? I think there's two reasons, there might be more, but I think two at least. One is in John 17. Remember the prayer of Jesus right before he went to the cross? What did he say? I pray that you would all be one. They would be one as we are. So in other words, it's a powerful example of Christianity if those people who naturally don't get along start getting along, That's right. if they start becoming one of one mind and one heart and one accord, it is a powerful example of the power of the gospel. That's right. Also, the second reason I think is that I need it for my own salvation. Mm -hmm. It might not even be for the other people, but Jill certainly needs to get out of my prejudice, my selfishness, my pride, and set that aside and learn to witness to those people that I wouldn't naturally reach out to of my own accord. Good. So first we witness to those at home in Jerusalem. Then we witness to those who are prejudiced against or those people we don't naturally hang with or like, the Samaritans. Mm. Then we witness to the entire world. The gospel's for the world. Pastor John read this, Revelation 14, 6. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Why do we share the gospel to the world? Well, we share it because God commanded us to. I think, Ryan, you read this, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This is Matthew 28, 19. God commanded us. He told us to go and take the gospel to the world. But in addition, I like this in 1 Corinthians 9, 16. It says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. So you see, once we have met Jesus, we cannot help but share him with others. Here's some quotes I like. This is from Billy Graham. Our faith becomes stronger as we express it. A growing faith is a sharing faith. This is from George Whitefield. Mm 
God forbid that I should travel with anybody a quarter of an hour without speaking of Christ to them. That's sobering. I could travel longer than a quarter of an hour without even speaking to Jesus. Wow, Dwight L. Moody, when a man is filled with the word of God, you cannot keep him still. If a man has got the word, he must speak or die. Hmm. Steps to Christ. No sooner does one come to Christ than there is born in his heart a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. Amen. So where is the gospel to be shared? In our neighborhood, to those we don't necessarily like or hang with into the entire world. And why are you and I called to share the gospel? Because God commanded us to. Because we need it. I need it for my own salvation. Because the most effective witness is when your life and my life has been transformed by the power of Jesus. Because once we have met Jesus, we cannot help but share Jesus with others. And finally, we do it because he first loved us. Amen. Mm, amen. Thank you guys so much. Powerful lesson, God's mission to us. Let's take some last few minutes I guess not minutes, but seconds to give some final thoughts. Making disciples, four things. Jesus wants to meet with us and we meet with him. He wants to empower us and then he promises to be with us to the very end of time. Amen. Amen. The everlasting gospel God announced in the Garden of Eden. He ratified it in a vision with Abraham and then he radically renewed it through the person of Jesus Christ. It is simply righteousness by faith and total dedication to him as we enter into covenant. That's right, and I like the one there in, he, in Genesis 12, when Abraham accepted that covenant uh, invitation. He didn't have to worry about where he was headed. God took care of all the details. Amen. Somebody's being called today to mission, and you might be wondering, how's it gonna happen? Mm -hmm. Exercise the faith of Abraham. Get out of your father's house. I'll show you where you're headed. That's the story of my wife and I, and here we are. 40 years later in marriage, mm. and what a journey it's been in that covenant walk with Christ. Amen. 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 If you don't have a burden for souls or you don't even desire to get out and outreach or evangelize, I just want to appeal to you to spend time with Jesus. Mm. Learning about who he is will transform your own burden for souls. Amen. Mm, amen. I love that. You cannot go and share what you don't have, my friends. Mm -hmm. We need to come to know Jesus first, and we're going to actually continue on that theme next week in lesson number three, which is entitled God's Call to Mission. And so we're just going to continue on this mission theme, learning. I love this lesson because it's, it's very practical. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get into some more practical lessons of how we can be the best witness for God. So thank you so much, as always, for joining us here on the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We will see you right back here next week.